believe in God the Father, we believe in Christ the Son, we believe in the Holy Spirit, we believe the three are one, we are the church and we stand as one, we believe in the Holy Bible, we believe in the virgin birth, we believe in the resurrection, that Christ one day will return to earth, we believe in the blood of Jesus, we believe in eternal life, we believe in the blood that frees us to become the bride of Christ. Join with me please in the spirit of prayer. Kind and loving Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we come with a heart filled with the joy and the victory of knowing Jesus, your Son, as our personal Savior. We thank you, Lord, for every blessing every day. We thank you for all the things that you placed within our trust to be used until our time of calling. We ask now, Lord, you'd look upon us with favor and forgive us of our sin, of our shortcoming, which so easily besets us. And yet today we know that our goal is to be more like the Master day by day to approach him and to approach you through God, the leadership that you provide in our lives with your spirit. We ask now that you would look upon us again with favor. We ask you this morning to open our hearts and minds to receive from the word what we individually need to draw us closer to the master in whose name we ask and pray. Amen. You may be seated. Morning. We might actually make a week without rain. Maybe. Possible. Yeah. All Hurry things up. are possible, only believe. Hey, man. So, I uh, you just you really want to see contractors hurry to get something done, let it rain nonstop for about a month. I didn't read it. I just said it was handwritten, and it was, and I let it stick. Maybe mom's good. Oh, okay. I don't know. Maybe. I just want to make sure that maybe. Got out time, I don't know. Okay, carry on. All right. Yeah, here we go. Round two. Uh, it's good to see everybody here today. Uh, welcome to our visitors today. Glad to have you folks. Um, the uh, you need to go take a look at the classrooms in the back that the men have been working on. They really look good really look good appreciate all the hard work and effort now we need to fill them up Amen. okay we need to fill them up so let's make that our next big goal and speaking of big goals I learned something this week that uh, when you're down on the ground tied up in a jujitsu knot the quickest way to get somebody to let go of you is to stick two fingers in his eye <laughs> <sighs> it works every time so uh, this morning, uh, we have one week left on our baby bottle campaign for the True Options Pregnancy Center. Um, encourage you to uh, fill up those baby bottles. If uh, we have some back there, I didn't notice. Okay, we still have some back there. If we run out of baby bottles, you can fill up an envelope, a Ziploc bag, whatever. The baby bottles will accept change. They'll accept folding money. They'll accept checks and uh, anything that we can do will help young ladies make the right decision regarding life. Um, there, there really is, the place is named True Options, there really only is one option, that option is life. We choose to participate in this, we've done it for several years. Uh, this uh, facility now has the means to do an on-site sonogram where they can immediately show a young lady the living being that is inside of them. They can also do mobile. They, they can have a mobile vehicle now that they're using well. Good, good deal. Mobile vehicle um, that they can go to where they are needed. Uh, that's a blessing right there. That really is. Um, and to, to show them what is actually happening inside their bodies. 87% uh, of the time, if a lady sees a sonogram, they will choose life. It's a very simple, quick procedure that has saved many, many a life. So uh, next Sunday morning, which is Father's Day, by the way, we will bring forward these baby bottles or these envelopes or these Ziploc bags or coffee cans or whatever you decide to put your money in. Uh, 
we will bless it and then we will send it out to this facility to continue the good work that they do. Um, this is something that is extremely easy to do. Filling one of these baby bottles with change, uh, it's amazing how quick change adds up. Just as, as a word of FYI, last year they collected thirty thousand dollars. Yes. Oh. Wow. Thirty thousand dollars, and I don't remember what the numbers were, but they told how many mothers, children that would provide for in years time. So thirty thousand dollars, if you think a baby bottle, just changing a baby bottle, it does matter. Yes, it makes a difference. True Options Pregnancy Center, um, if you decide to write a check. Um, like I said, uh, we have chosen to participate in this for several years now. I anticipate that we will do this probably for the foreseeable future. Um, this is another one of the mission projects this church chooses to be a part of. We have mission projects that go on all the year. We have Lottie Moon, we have Annie Armstrong, and most of this money goes either across North America or overseas, and we do not get to see results of it with our own eyes. We accept by faith that it's going out to do the good work of the Lord. But this, along with Greenhouse and uh, Grand Central Station, and excuse me, uh, our local mission projects that we choose to participate in that we can see the results of with our own eyes right here in our own community. We can actually shake the hands of people that we help. We can give them a good hug with the love of the Lord right here in our own community. It is amazing the amount of homeless people in Grayson County. Um, so we as a church have decided this is something we want to do. Um, as I've always said, we may be small in numbers, we are large and strong in spirit. And uh, per percentage wise, we probably contribute more to missions than most of the large churches around here. Um, because that's what we feel driven to do. So we, we encourage you to be a part of that. Um, also the uh, Grand Central Station, uh, they're needing some more of the small toiletry items as summer is approaching. Summer will get here, I promise you. It may hit 100 degrees this coming week, okay? Um, they need uh, summer type items, uh, clothing, toiletry items, things like that. Uh, like I said, this is something ongoing, but we feel called to participate in it. So let's keep all that in our thoughts and prayers. Um, and it's not too late to do spring cleaning, okay? and I live at 1420 West Law. Okay. Um, our financial report for uh, June so far, uh, insurance fund, we've got about $25 uh, for, toward the June insurance payment of 220. Uh, this insurance policy was a direct blessing from the Lord. Uh, we were in a bad, bad way when this uh, opportunity presented itself. Um, for us to get a better policy with better coverage for less money. That's hardly ever heard of in the insurance industry. And uh, we, uh, we have dad to thank for researching that out. And uh, as I, I always have to say, this is not a holy place. So many religions around the world consider their places of worship holy. They are not. Uh, no matter how ornate and beautiful they are, they are not holy places. When we leave, the Spirit leaves with us. If the Spirit did not leave with us and stayed in this place when we were gone, then we wouldn't have the, the comforting hand of the Lord with us all the time. So uh, while we're here, it's filled with the Spirit. When we leave, it goes with us. But we are still charged to take care of this place. So let's keep that in mind. Um, tonight, Dad will be teaching uh, from the three books of John. Are you just starting this this week? No, we're in the middle. You're in the middle of it? Okay. Um, John 1, 2, and 3. Uh, three of the shorter books in the Bible, but there is so, so much good good teaching and information in those three books toward the end of the Bible. Uh, 6 o'clock tonight uh, till about 7 or whenever he decides to uh, end it. And uh, we encourage you to come be a part of that. It's a wonderful, wonderful study in the Word of God. Um, this morning, 
We uh, need to lift up continued prayers for uh, Jim and Dina's son. He's going home today. He's going home today, praise he the Lord. He's having surgery Thursday evening and he's going home Sunday. That's a miracle. That, that is, is a miracle. A miracle. Yes, ma'am, it is. The doctor has his mouth wide open and his eyes are big. Thank you. So uh, we, uh, we know that there was a flood of prayers yes. sent out for, the, for this man. Um, it's a very, very dangerous situation he found himself in. And, uh, but through the healing power of the Lord, he's going to get to go home today. Amen. That's amazing. Amen. It is amazing. Um, so uh, we're grateful for that. I would also this week ask for prayers from my boss, uh, Mr. Steve Methern. From, uh, he works in Greenville. He actually lives in Paris. He uh, left work early Friday, not feeling good, went to the doctor, and turns out he has blood poisoning from a fish hook yep. he got in his hand. And uh, he wasn't near as upset about the blood poisoning as he was when the doctor told him, you can't go fishing this weekend. And he said, what? I could duct tape it to my hand, and, you know. So anyway, he's a, he's a devout man of God. He's a minister in his own right. Um, me and him share a couple things in common that uh, he is also a uh, recovering alcoholic. He works with uh, AA meetings and uh, mentors people uh, in uh, trying to overcome the demon of alcohol. He's a great, great man. One of the best people I've ever worked for. Uh, but uh, Friday, he put on Facebook, had a picture of his hand swollen up. Looks like he's got a boxing glove on. He's got blood poisoning from a fish hook. So let's let's remember him in our prayers today. Um, this morning, let's go ahead, take a hymn and stand together, and let's turn to number 546. Yes. I will. Okay. All right, hang on just a second. And by the way, when we do love, lift you me, instead of love, lift you me, let's do Christ, lift you me. All right. Joyce? Would you like to read your poem? You wrote it. Okay, y'all can have a seat. Joyce, you read poems much better. Yeah, you read them much, much better than I do. Um, my poetry of late has come in the form of prose, and I didn't. I don't even know what that is. I remember many, many years ago reading some and the young man who handed me his poetry to read which I thought it all had to rhyme <laughs> and he said no no this is like prose and I'm going okay so it's not poetry <laughs> it's prose a few yeah, a, a couple of years ago this is probably my third one and this came out like this and I'm still amazed that it doesn't rhyme <laughs> but God does lay things on my heart and with <clears throat> With our baby bottle campaign, I find it sometimes hard to say the word abortion. It's, a, it's another word for, for murder. It's another word for desperation. It's another word for a worthlessness to a young woman sometimes in need. But above all, uh, our children that are being lost to these decisions. This is like, it came, poems come to me in different, uh, from different people. This one is from uh, the unborn child and it's called A Different Plan. Lord, you designed a plan for my life before I was in my mother's womb. Lord, you knew me. I was safe with you. You sent me to be born again so I might find you again. Man had a different plan. Yours is the right one. Amen. Thank you. I would be lost. <laughs> okay, now let's all stand together, turn number 546. was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. 
But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Christ lifted me, Christ lifted me. When nothing else could help, Christ lifted me. Christ lifted me, Christ lifted me. Presence then ever is praise to sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to to Him belongs. Christ lifted me, Christ lifted me. When nothing else could help, Christ lifted me, Christ lifted me. Lifted me when nothing else could help. Christ lifted me. Souls in danger look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. Billows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be, be saved today. Christ lifted me, Christ lifted me. When nothing else could help, Christ lifted me. Christ lifted me, Christ lifted me. seated. Let's turn over now to number 608. comes will work till Jesus comes will work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home to Jesus Christ I pled for rest he bade me cease to roam and lean for comfort on his breast till he conducts me home we'll work Till Jesus comes, we'll work. Till Jesus comes, we'll work. Till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. I saw that once my Savior's side, no more my steps to roam. comes will work till Jesus comes will work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home man we don't sing that one no. <laughs> for our offertory our service tell us that we needed to try some different songs yes. and that's what I'm trying well there you go <laughs> for our offertory <laughs> For our offertory hymn, let's all stand together. It says 572, but look right across the page, it's 571. <laughs> Either one of them could. We'll pick one. No, let's do 571. You said we didn't sing that very much. I, I did. <laughs> While passing through this world of sin and others your life shall view be clean and pure without within let others see Jesus <coughs> let others 
see Jesus in you. Let others see Jesus in you. Keep telling the story, be faithful and true. Let others see Jesus in you. Your life's a book, they read, their eyes, they're reading it through and through. Say, does it point them to the skies? Do others see Jesus in you? Let others see Jesus in you. Let others see Jesus in you. Keep telling the story, be faithful and true. Let others see Jesus in you. Then live for Christ day and night. Be faithful, be brave and true. And lead the lost to light and light. Let others see Jesus in you. Let others see Jesus in you. Let others see Jesus in you. Tell the story, be faithful and true. Let others see Jesus in you. Let's join together in the spirit of prayer. Kind and loving Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to be able to have a time of prayer before you. When we could ask you by your spirit to search our hearts and know our minds bring us into that right beautiful relationship of total service and commitment we thank you now for this special time in the life of our service we ask you to bless both the gift and the giver it's our prayer today that that which is given will be done in the spirit of love the spirit of commitment and we ask now that we'd have the leadership of spirit in our fellowship of our church to use it for the single purpose of bringing men women and boys and girls to know jesus christ I thank you this morning, Lord, for each one before us today. It's my prayer that thy spirit will open the hearts and minds of each to receive, and we'll go away with the bountiful saying, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. We ask this blessing over this offering service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dean's going to come sing praises. She has a lot to be excited about, don't you? Amen. You know, some people say, boy, you've had a bad week. On the way to church this morning, I looked at Jim, and I said, hadn't this been a good week? Amen. Amen. This has been a great week. It's been an amazing week. My son, our son, somebody's son, somebody's brother, somebody's uncle, somebody's cousin, somebody's grandpa. <sighs> Through his own fault, because he didn't go to the doctor when he had a wreck a month ago, he could have been home with Jesus. <laughs> but the Lord let him linger, and he, and he made it hard enough on him that he went to the doctor. So he had brain surgery on Thursday, Thursday afternoon late. I think he got out about 6.30, something like that. Today's Sunday, Thursday to Friday to Saturday. It's not been three full days since surgery. He's going home today. He rose on the third day. Uh, the doctor, the, neur the neurosurgeon is still going, you know. But let me tell you something. There's been some hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands, I don't know, of prayers for that young man. And I was never afraid. I just have to say that. I wasn't ever afraid. Did I have 
angst sometimes, but I was never afraid because I knew it, my fear wouldn't do anything, but my prayers would. Amen. So I'm not going to talk all day because preacher is. <laughs> <laughs> but I thank you all for your prayers. Noel, you sure are pretty. message this morning. Let's all stand. Turn to number 244. This morning, I would ask for silent prayers that we can fill every classroom back here.
Okay. Not too much. That's about right. Thank you. Well, I imagine when you sit on it, it'll go down a little bit. Oh, thank you. Did y'all hear that last statement? Once you sit down, it's going to go down quite a bit more. That's not what I said. He said, actually, he said a little bit, but I knew he meant a whole lot more. This morning, we'd like to ask you to uh, take your Bible. If you don't have one, there's a pew Bible probably there in front of you. And turn in our scripture this morning to the book of Philippians, the uh, third chapter. We're going to begin by looking at the 14th verse. I don't ever title messages, but if I had given this a title, I would have probably said something like this, how to know you are growing in Jesus, because that's what we're going to talk about this morning. In Philippians 3.14, the Apostle Paul writes these words, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you're here this morning and you're a believer, I hope you realize that you have received the highest possible calling in all of our world today. Amen. You know, it's not to be a doctor, to be a lawyer, to be a, a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. It's the highest calling of all is to come and know Jesus as your personal Savior. Down in chapter 4 of Philippians, beginning in verse 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Now, if we look at that verse and break it down just a little bit, first of all, it says, when it says be careful for nothing, it means don't fail to pray about everything. That's what he's really trying to say. Okay? But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Have you ever thought about the fact that before we pray or as we start our prayer, it ought to be, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for rescuing me, as Joyce wrote about in the prose this morning. Being rescued by God through faith in Christ is the greatest experience of your entire life because it alters your entire life. More than even our life here, it alters our eternity. And so we want to think about that for just a moment. Then it says, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So if you're going to have your heart and your mind focused on Jesus, after you pray, you need to be sure you spend time on the Word. See? You know when we're furthest away from God? When we've been longer away from the Word. That's when we're furthest away from God. And then he says, and Paul writes, uh, he's very personal in his fourth chapter of Philippians, verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of one, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. What is he content about? He's content in Christ, you see. Being content in Christ is more than food and clothing and shelter and all the other things we think about so readily on a ba daily basis is that the fact that we have a re relationship with Jesus Christ that can never be altered or never be changed by what happens in our life. We this morning are in the most secure place in the world. I was watching a little TV yesterday afternoon and I saw a man talking about a new home security system. Now, I'm not telling you don't have a home security system, but if somebody wants you in your house, they will get in. They will come in. I remember a number of years ago, a man that was somewhere in the outside skirts of Houston had built a home of concrete and steel and he did not have any windows. He didn't have a single window in the house. The walls were like 30 inches thick. He said, I've got the safest house in the world, okay? And he had steel doors and he felt perfectly content once he went into that home that he was in the safest possible place until the thieves decided to come in. And when they did, they brought their own power equipment. They brought their own resources. They brought their own saws and they sawed right through the middle of his door. He was not killed, but they robbed him. They opened the safe, took everything in, and he realized something. Security is not in the building. Security is in the relationship of your heart with Jesus Christ. And he, came, he was a Christian, but he came to realize there's no way I can protect myself beyond the protection Christ has already given me. And that's what we need to focus on for just a few moments this morning. Paul writes and said, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Some days are better than others, aren't they? Sure they are. But on your worst day, it's better than a lost person's day. Think about that. Next time you're having a bad day, a down day, or a bad week, or a down week, think about how much better off you are than a person who does not know Jesus Christ. 
Their house might be bigger, their car might be bigger, they might have their own plane or planes, but that's not what this is about. This is about a living, vital relationship with Jesus Christ your Lord. Then he says in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Think about how little strength we have without Jesus. It's pretty rough, you know. I'd hate to get up and face tomorrow without Jesus. I don't want to face the rest of the day without Jesus. I don't want to face any time without Jesus because that's our strength. That's what we draw on. Verse 19 said, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And the key word there, if you write in your Bible or underline your Bible, would be the word need. It doesn't have an S on it. We all talk about our needs, you know. I need this, I need that. No, you don't. You have one need, the need to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. In the book of Colossians chapter 1, probably a page or so over from where you are currently now, I want you to look at verse 13 as to what God has done for us. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, the power of darkness of sin, hath translated us or changed us into the kingdom of His dear Son. You see, we made a transition from being a lost person to being a saved person. We made a transition from this world ruling our lives and souls and this future world in which Christ has provided for us. In verse 14 it said, to whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of his sin. That's the greatest challenge in life is to have your sins forgiven. Because only one person can do it. And his name is Jesus. Only one shed blood can wash you clean, the blood of Jesus. Only one life can be given for you, the life of Jesus, which pays your sin debt before God. And then he says, even forgiveness of sin. Now down in verse 17 it said, He is before all things and by Him are all things consist. Everything's consistent because God's got it in place, okay? He's the head of the body, the church, which is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have preeminence means first place. First place. The most important place for Christ in your life is the first place. Before you do anything in your life, you should consider what would Jesus want me to do? Would Jesus be favorable with my decision? Would Jesus be willing to, to stand by me in this? Or have I stepped off path? We stop and think about that. For it pleased the Father in Him should all fullness dwell. Everything we would ever need is supplied to us in Jesus Christ. Having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. It's not where you stand in, stand in your social standing. It's not where you stand in the money standing. It's not where you stand in the possession standing. It's where do you stand in terms of Jesus. Because if you don't know Jesus, you don't have anything. And your life consists of just your little bitty group of days here. And they're little bitty ones compared to an eternity with the Lord. You see? Most of us often think about, I wonder how many days I have left. Okay? But the Bible tells us, that Jesus has done something marvelous for us in verse 22 of Colossians 1. In the body of his flesh through death, he went to the cross and died to present us holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. And the Bible tells us that's what's important there, you see, that we understand how to do that. In Colossians 2, 6, which again is Annabelle's favorite verse, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus Lord, so walk you in him. And then in verse 8 he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. And Satan is so powerful in the areas of vain deceit. Okay? Vain deceit. I remember meeting a woman many, many years ago. Matter of fact, before Anna and I were ever married. And I ran into her downtown one afternoon. And I said, I haven't seen you in church in a long time. And she said, well, I'm not going to church. And I said, well, what do you mean you're not going to church? She's gone for years. And she said, well, I got my feelings hurt and I'm just not going back. And I said, well, what happened to you? She said, the lady told me my hat did not look good on me with my outfit. And I thought, lady, you left serving God over someone's comment on a hat, you know? But we're like that, aren't we? Most of us carry our real little tiny feelings right up here on our shoulders. And no one can come by and just flip one of them off and then we're real upset. And so I talked with her over a period of time and I said, you know, look who's losing in this. I promise you the lady that said it hadn't thought about it anymore. But you have thought about it every day. Don't give her that kind of power over you. Don't give her that kind of power. Don't let anyone ever say something to you that depowers you and empowers them. 
But we do that all the time, you know. And so many times I've often used this as my example, but you may not like this tie, but you don't have to like it. I liked it, so that's why I wore it. But I didn't say, I wonder if they'll all like this tie. Well, I don't know. Well, maybe I shouldn't wear it. But how, what would I know about the next one? So I just chose this one, you see. Yeah. And we thought to stop and think, it's easy to decide your why, because we are facing the challenge of their own philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, okay? Now, what are some of those traditions of men that we see fading away in our world today? Anna and I pass a couple of churches as we go to the house, and in the evening, Sunday evenings, they don't have service. We pass some of them coming to church on Wednesday night, they don't have service. They have a morning service and a, service, and a night service on Sunday, and they don't have any church the rest of the week. I have trouble with that. I have trouble because the night we had a storm, we didn't get to have a midweek service. It seemed like it had been six months since I'd been in church, you see? And so we have to focus on what is important with us. Look at verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. That's not in the water behind me. That's in the blood of Jesus. Wherein we are risen from him, with him, through the operation of the faith of God who raised him from the dead. That means one day, those of us who are under the blood by faith and rise out of that to walk in a newness of life, will one day also be raised from the asleep in Jesus of our graves to being in the presence of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 14, Colossians 2. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinance which was against us. That's a tough one. That means we have to realize this morning that when we mess up, the angels write it down. And that's what their job is. And wonder why the angels write it down. Is it because God might forget it without a list? No. It's to impress upon us how important it is, the daily decisions of our life. And those decisions, if they're not right and proper, we must ask God for forgiveness. But if we don't do that, they lie on the list till we get to Revelation 20, 11 through 15, where we're judged out of the things written in the book. And it's, and it's about our choices. And that's what these decisions are about which are contrary to us and took it out of the way and nailing it to his cross. Now all the sins I committed and you committed before we became a Christian, however good, bad, or indifferent, at the cross, when we trust Christ, those are gone. They're gone forever. The Bible says there's a forest east and west that God never remembers them against us again. You know? Never remembers us against, again, uh, that, uh, against us again. So we start with that clean page. And it's our job to keep the clean page clean page from becoming a different kind of page. Colossians 3.15 said, let the peace of God rule in your heart. If God's ruling in your heart, that means you consider Christ at every decision. If Christ is ruling in your heart, that means you're focused on what God would have you to do. We need to study the Bible to know exactly what he wants us to do, how to do it, and what strength to use to do it, and to allow God to be real in our life, and not just some object out there that we say, well, I believe, people, when people say, I believe in God, I say, sorry about that. And they say, what do you mean, sorry about that? I said, believing in God doesn't get you anywhere. Believing in a supreme being doesn't get you anywhere. Believing in the creator doesn't get you anywhere. You have to believe in Jesus. Because Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. If you don't know Jesus, you will never, ever, 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 ever get to know God. Because it's not possible if you do that, you see. And if we miss that or mess that up, then we've got real challenges. In the marvelous book of Timothy, 2 Timothy, please, chapter 1. In the seventh verse it says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear. All of us have fear in our lives from time to time, but when it comes, God didn't send it. Satan sent it. Why would Satan send fear into your life? Because it makes us weak. Did y'all realize that? When we're in filled with fear, we're weak. We're not focused on the power of God. We said God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and a spirit of love and a spirit of a sound mind. You've got so much scripture in your life because you've read it and prayed over it and been taught it that you can call upon so much when you have fear. When fear comes, it's time to go to your informational vault. You know, 
You know, we all love, I think, Psalms 23, but we probably don't focus on Psalms 23 quite as much as we should. But in Psalms 23, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's just getting up in the morning. See? I had an uncle that slipped in the shower and died with a broken neck. He was dead when he hit the, about the time he hit the tub. Okay? So when you get up in the morning, you need to think about the fact this is a pretty tough place I'm going to be in today, you know? Uh, Annabelle's mom went to New York City. And while she was in New York City, she said one time she heard some people, a little girl screaming, and she finally looked out the hotel door. And between the two, this hotel and another building, there was an alleyway, and there were a bunch of kids lighting pieces of paper and throwing on this little girl. And she was just a screaming, okay? See? And I thought based on that, I don't think I want to go to New York. See? I want to be safe. But you know, the safest place to be is in that right relationship with Jesus. The safest place to be is where you have let God pour into your life the power, the love, and the sound mind. Verse 9 of that same passage says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Now, you might say, well, that's for preachers. That's for evangelists. No, it's not. It's for every Christian. Amen. Where would we be today if Paul and Peter and James and John and Matthew and Mark and Luke and thousands of others had not felt a holy calling, you see, to go do what God asked them to do. You know, he stopped at the seashore and said to the fishermen, come follow me. They said straightway they left their nets and followed Jesus, you see. Did they know where they were going to go and what they were going to do and how they were going to do it? No, I didn't have a clue. They weren't even sure what he was talking about. But they went down the road with him and he sat down and taught them. And he did that day after day after day after day after day for about three and a half years to try to instill within them what happens when we read the word, you see? The psalmist said in that 23rd Psalm, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, okay? The rod is the power of God and the staff comforts you because it's the, the little crook staff and he would reach out and pull the little lambs out of the bad holes and he would fend off the offenders as they came. He could drive off the wolf. He could drive off all the ones that would come after the sheep. And because of that brings us comfort. See? Our comfort is knowing that Jesus will take care of us. Our comfort is knowing that Jesus Christ wants to take care of us. So he says, it saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, not because we've done something great and magnificent, but because we were strong enough and caring enough to ask for what we couldn't do ourselves. We asked Jesus to save us according to his own purpose and grace. God has a purpose for every life that comes to him. It's not always ministry. It might be teaching in a Sunday school class. It, it might be witnessing. Uh, it might be just living that God-fearing life that God's called us to do. It's just called about living in within the word and knowing what God asked us to do and doing it, you see? It might be in song, it might be in praise, it might be in, in prose, it might be in poetry. I don't know what it is, see? But it's something God's given you. And it's his purpose and then he provides what? And grace to do it. Grace to do it. See, it's not about you, not about me, it's about God's grace. And where do all these things come from? Look at the last part of verse nine. Which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Do you ever sit down and think about the fact that the whole plan was laid out before he ever left glory? Before God ever created the heavens and the earth? Before he ever created the earth? Before he ever created Adam and Eve and all the animals? It was already taken care of. He already knew that, you know? Now, in 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. It don't make a difference what... Don't ever study to please me. Don't ever search the word and run your references to please me. You do it to please God. If you're wondering why God put all those, had somebody put these references in the middle of that little middle stretch of your Bibles? I know what, he hoped we would use it. See? So we could build more strength. Each scripture is almost like a building block. It's tied to another building block, which is tied to another building block, which is tied to another building block. And so if you read this verse, and then run the references and get the supporting verses, then you've got a nice, nice wall of power there. 
So many times we just read one and move on. Okay? He says we're to be a workman, working at the things of God. That needs not to ever be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You cannot rightly divide what you do not know. You know, a lot of times people don't realize that. You have to know it to be able to divide it and share it with somebody else. It's kind of like a big old piece of lemon meringue pie with a whole lot of that big old tall standing on top. You know, it's called meringue. My mom used to make them, they'd have a meringue about like that. We went to a restaurant one time and then went in and they were about like this. I thought, man, I never saw so much meringue on a pie in my life. And by the way, let me tell you something, it was good all the way to the end, all the way to the end. But what's important this morning is to understand what Jesus asked. Let's look at John's gospel, chapter 10, for just a moment. He said, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door to the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. By definition, there'll be no thieves and robbers in heaven. There are thieves and robbers, why? Because they haven't trusted Jesus, you see? It says here, he that enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them. You know, we follow Jesus. He's not following us. We follow Jesus. Okay. You know, you drive cattle, but you lead sheep. And we are sheep. And they're not smart either. And don't be, get your feelings hurt, neither are we. Verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved, shall go in and out, and shall find pasture. And that means provision. Okay? What did Paul say earlier in our scripture? I know how to be abased a and how to abound. I know how to be happy when I've got a lot and happy in God when I have a little. You see, that's the thing that's important. There's nothing you'll ever achieve in your life from birth to death as important as your faith in Christ and how you utilize that make a different, makes a difference in your life. He says in verse 11 of John 10, I'm the good shepherd and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But one of the most exciting things he says in this wonderful book of John is 1125. When he said to Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Think about that. Death does not enclose us because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Our bodies are gone. We've left our family. We've left our friends. But what have we done? We're asleep waiting for rapture. And for us, that'll be that quick. Might be thousands of years, but for us, it'll be that quick. You see, the Bible says to, to be absent from the body is to be with the Lord even though there may be a long gap in there of time, but the time won't mean anything. How could time mean anything to you if you're asleep in Jesus? It couldn't, you see? So if I die now, I'll be with Jesus. It might be thousands of years, but for all of us, it'll be the same time. And we won't know there's any time in between. For us, it's instantaneous based on God's law. It says, there is no respect of persons with God in the second chapter of the book of Romans. Why is our world like it is today? There's no respect of persons with God. God doesn't favor one over the other, okay? But what does he tell us in Romans 3.10? Uh, As it's written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I've written in my Bible, I am a sinner and I am a sinner. I'm a sinner saved by grace now, but once I was just a plain old sinner. I didn't have a savior. I had a Lord though, Satan. Some people don't like to say that. I've been told many times, well, I never listened to Satan. Oh, yes, you did. Before you met Jesus, you did. You did it every day, all day long. Because I know, because I did it. You see, our world molds us if we're not strong enough to choose Christ and let Christ mold us by our faith. There's the difference. Our world's like it is today because verse 18 says there's no fear of God before their eyes. Okay? But let me look at verse 19. This is really important. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. All the world become guilty before God. 
Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. You'll find that in Revelation 21, 4, when he wipes away all that out of our lives. You see, this is one of the most wonderful experiences that we can have. If you'll join me in 1 Corinthians, I'm going to close with this passage in the 15th chapter, beginning verse 3. This is Paul again writing. I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. That's what we could tell anybody any day we came upon somebody. I'd like to tell you about Jesus who gave his life according to what God said in God's Word for the purpose of saving me and hopefully saving you. See? And he was buried and he rose again the third day. And why did he rise the third day? The Scripture told us it would. Remember the day he told the disciples, I will rise again. In three days I'll be up, but nobody was there watching outside the tomb. Even when the women came and said, the Lord is risen. And I spoke with him. And I saw his hands. And what did they say? Well, maybe you're just kind of dreaming. See how quickly we forget. Well, how, it's just a little short of a number of days. Jesus and I will rise again. They done forgot about it. And what did he tell them? He said, I'll go before you into Galilee. Meet me in Galilee. They weren't in Galilee because they didn't accept. They'd never seen death come and death be restored. You see, they hadn't seen that. If they were there on the day when Lazarus was resurrected by our Lord. You know, the Lord, I love the, the passage when they rolled the stone away and, and Jesus said, loose him and let him come forth. And he came, came forth hand and foot wrapped in his, in his grave clothes. He must have just kind of tippy toed out. But he couldn't turn himself loose. But what happened after that? Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Let him do, go what? Let him go, let the world see him. Let the world go hear about him. Let the world realize that he has risen from the dead. Let the world know I have power over life and death. That's why he sent him on that mission. And then lastly, he says that uh, in verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And that's what we are. We're nothing more, nothing less. His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. That's what Paul wrote. And I, I don't feel he's in vain upon us. He said, I labored more abundantly than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. God's grace never leaves you. And this wonderful resurrection experience of Christ, Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians 15, 17. If Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain and you're still in your sins. Isn't that something? I don't want to still be in my sins, do you? No, I don't. I want to be in Revelation 21, 4. In that verse, he says, God shall wipe out all your tears. That's after judgment. Judgment's going to be rough on Christians. It's going to be rougher on non-believers, but it'll be rough on Christians. Okay? There'll be that time when someone said, you said you were my friend, and you never told me about Jesus. You said that we were close, but you never told me about the closeness of Christ. You said we were working together, but apparently we were working on two different projects. You didn't tell me about working on the project of knowing Jesus and following him. So he'll wipe away all tears from our eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. And all the former things are passed away. That's why in heaven you won't do like I hear people say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Samson, what was it like to get your hair cut? No. You won't know Samson. He might be standing just in front of you, to the right of you, to the left of you, or behind you, but you won't know him as Samson. You'll know him as a child of God. We'll be the children of God. We won't know about David. We won't know about Isaiah. We won't know about Moses. None of those things are going to happen, folks. You know? You know the things I hate the most in funerals? When some preacher says, you know, we're preaching grandmother's funeral and, you know, grandma's looking down on you. How could she be looking down? If she was in heaven, God had to put her back in the grave to resurrect her, wouldn't he? So she's not there yet. We're not there yet, see? We have some spiritual experiences related in the Bible of people who are there. The prophet Elijah was called up. 
Enoch was translated or changed into a heavenly body and taken, but the rest of us don't have that experience. We're waiting for Jesus. And when we get that judgment, many tears will be shed. Many tears. There'll be tears. We'll say things like this. Hey, I'm sorry. I guess I was just too busy. I'm sorry. I just didn't think about you. I'm sorry. I didn't think you'd think it was important. I'm sorry. I thought you'd find him by yourself. My closing statement is this. No one, no one finds Jesus by themselves. Every person in this room today is a product of someone's mission work. Someone gave, someone prayed, someone shared, someone invited, someone pointed you to Jesus, or you wouldn't know him today as your Savior. Let's pray together. Kind and loving Heavenly Father, we are so grateful today that we can be in this place and have an opportunity to search your word and let your spirit open it to our hearts and minds. We ask now this morning that you would be with those who are sick of our church. We ask that you be with Bobby Gregory. We pray for her daily. We pray, Lord, for Pat as he makes a, what appears a speedy recovery, and we pray it is that he'll soon be back with the activities of family and friends and work. But most of all this morning, Lord, we pray for those who do not know Jesus. So we know so many, our lives touch so many that we've never invited them to know Christ. Give us strength, give us wisdom, and give us courage to do what you've called us to do, to be one who ministers the word, not a minister of the word, but a ministers the word, which simply means to share it with somebody who doesn't know Christ. Bless us in these moments and forgive us of our sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Now stand, please. 307.